In August 2008, after a seven-year delay, NIST, the government agency charged with investigating the World Trade Center collapses, released the draft of their final report on the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 for public comment. In that report, they claimed that the time for the building to fall, the first 18 stories, that's the part of the collapse visible on many videos, was 40% longer than it would have taken had it been in free fall. I responded with a video posted on YouTube called WTC7 in free fall, in which I showed that for approximately two and a half seconds, Building 7 fell at a rate indistinguishable from free fall. Furthermore, in that video I showed that NIST's methodology was not a valid way to analyze the true motion of the building. NIST's measurement was not just wrong, it was fraudulent. Then on August 26th, NIST staged a technical briefing in which engineers and others with technical credentials could pose questions. I'm a high school physics teacher, so I figured I would be excluded. However, I went ahead and registered, citing my membership in the American Association of Physics Teachers as my professional affiliation. By the way, I am not speaking for AAPT. That was just my passport into the briefing. To my surprise, my credentials were accepted, and I was able to pose a question. Here's a little of how it went. Our next question comes from David Chandler of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, any number of competent measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet your report contradicts this cl claiming 40 percent slower than free fall based on a single data point. Uh, how can such a publicly visible, easily measurable quantity be set aside? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, any number of measurements using a variety of methods indicate the northwest corner of WTC7 fell with an acceleration within a few percent of the acceleration of gravity. Yet the report contradicts this, claiming 40 percent slower than the free fall based on a single data point. Well, um, the, first of all, um, gravity is the loading function that applies to the structure, uh, at, uh, applies, to, applies to every body, every, all bodies on, uh, on, uh, on, on this particular, uh, on this planet, not just um, um, in, in ground zero. Whoa. I'm used to responses like that on a physics exam when a student hasn't even bothered to open the book. But this is NIST speaking, so let's continue. Um, the, uh, the analysis showed there's a difference in time between a free fall time. A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Uh, and if you look at the analysis of the video, it shows that the time it takes for the 17 uh, for the, uh, the the roof line of the video to do, to uh, collapse down the 17 floors that you can actually see in the video below which you can't see anything in the video is about uh, 3.9 seconds. Uh, what the analysis shows and uh, the structural analysis shows or the collapse analysis shows it's that same time that it took for the structural model to come down from the roof line all the way for those 17 floors to disappear is um, 5.4 seconds. It's uh, about 1.5 uh, uh, seconds or roughly 40 percent more time for that free fall to happen. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, uh, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and where everything was not instantaneous. Buried in all that verbiage, what Dr. Sundar is saying is, free fall for the 18 stories under consideration would have taken 3.9 seconds. However, their computer model simulating collapse required 5.4 seconds. The slower collapse time was to be expected since there was structure supporting the building as it fell, slowing the fall, that there was a progression of failures that had to take place, and that these were not instantaneous. All of this makes sense as long as you don't look at the evidence. The evidence shows that free fall actually occurred, but since their computer modeling could not come up with a scenario that would allow for free fall, they had to declare free fall out of bounds and try to cover up the evidence. 
The problem is, unlike the columns and girders buried deep inside the building, the motion of the building is right out in plain view. Since their model predicted 5.4 seconds for the 18-story collapse, they dutifully conjured up a 5.4 second measurement to match. They had to stretch themselves to do it, but they did it. They found the disappearance time, then they went out of their way to pick an artificially early start time, exactly 5.4 seconds earlier. This they compared with freefall time. This next question comes from Dr. Stephen Jones. Uh, NIST discusses the fall time for WTC7 on page 40 of the summary report, where uh, it stated, assuming that the descent speed was approximately constant. However, observations uh, by others of the descent speed show that the building is accelerating uh, rather than uh, being at constant speed. Uh, so the question is, why did NIST assume that the descent speed was approximately constant? Stephen Jones was calling attention to the obviously erroneous claim on page 40 of the draft report that stated that the building descended at constant speed. I'm sure constant speed was a simple misstatement. The correct response should have been, whoops, we'll fix that. But no, here's how they handled that question. Um, force of gravity obviously is, uh, uh, the acceleration of gravity is uh, what's uh, at the driving force and uh, uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video. Uh, that um, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, um, search of the of the uh, time so that was down to one thirtieth of a second um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared uh, we found that um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds I didn't hear a whoops in there did you this is John Gross one of the lead engineers for the NIST report on the collapse of the Twin Towers he has a PhD in structural engineering from Cornell University he taught engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He has a long resume on top of that. Don't you think he probably knows the difference between speed and acceleration? Don't you think he could explain it with perfect clarity if he wasn't so preoccupied trying to cover his tracks? Don't you find it interesting that the 5.4 seconds he measured for the collapse time just happens to exactly match the theoretical prediction of their model? That kind of precision is incredibly rare when modeling real-world events. Incredible is the right word. It's not credible. This measurement has all the characteristics of what we call dry labbing, manipulating the data to fit a predetermined outcome. It's an ethics violation in science on a par with plagiarism. Any engineers engaging in this kind of sleight of hand should lose their licenses. The larger implication, of course, is dry labbing in this kind of investigation would constitute a criminal cover-up. After another round of quibbling, someone had to step in and bail out poor John. Can you clarify that? Uh, I think it's uh, something that we need to clarify and correct in the final version of the report. Okay. Sure. That was August. This is November. The final version of the NIST WTC7 report just came out. And guess what? We have a revised analysis of the building collapse rate. Constant speed is out. Constant acceleration is out. Instead, we have three phases of collapse, with a whopping 2.25 seconds of absolute freefall. The irrelevant 5.4 seconds is still defended in the wording, but it plays no apparent role other than CYA for John Gross and Associates. So freefall is hereby official dogma. How are they going to handle all the ramifications of that inconvenient fact? Read on. It says... The three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST's NC Star 1-9. That's it. Freefall went from an impossibility that required backflips in logic to obfuscate to a simple fact to be measured then declared consistent with their fire-induced collapse hypothesis. Apparently they have now decided that freefall is okay as long as it is seen as a part of a longer stretch of time that covers the required 5.4 seconds. 
In other words, they dropped the bullying tactic of blowing smoke to obscure the facts and adopted an alternate bullying tactic, cover it with a lie and walk away. However, NIST cannot walk away from freefall. Now that NIST has certified freefall as fact, take a look at the implications. Part two of this series was going to be an exploration of the significance of NIST's admission that World Trade Center Building 7 underwent a period of freefall acceleration. That'll have to wait for part three. After suggesting in part one of this video that John Gross's method for determining the time of fall might constitute dry labbing, in other words, falsifying measurements to support a predetermined outcome, I got curious to know exactly what event he picked to start the clock. The measurement is a little tedious, but the result is very significant. That's often the way it is in science, so stay with me on this one. Let's start with John Gross's explanation of how he determined the time of fall. By the way, you might recall this was not the question he was asked, but it is the answer he gave. Uh, our calculation was uh, based on the amount of time from the uh, top of the parapet uh, to fall till it uh, disappeared from view between the two buildings uh, seen in the uh, video, uh, that um, uh, time was uh, established from the uh, uh, video uh, by a uh, single frame. Um, uh, search of the, of the uh, time, so that was down to one thirtieth of a second. Um, and then we did the same thing for when the top of the parapet uh, disappeared. Uh, we found that, um, that time to be uh, 5.4 seconds. To identify the point he picked as the start of collapse, we have to work backward. The ending point of his measurement was when the roof line came down to the level of the 29th floor. In our video, there's a structure on the roof of a foreground building that lines up with the 29th floor of Building 7, so it's easy to identify. I imported the video into a measurement program called Video Point, which has a frame counter, and step forward to the frame where the roof line lines up with the foreground marker. That's frame 178, counting from the first frame of the video clip I'm using. At 30 frames per second, 5.4 seconds comes out to be 162 frames. Subtracting this from frame 178 brings us to frame 16. So let's go back and see what's happening at or about frame 16. I put a red mark on frame 16, so as it goes by, you'll recognize it. Let's go back to the beginning and step through this section of the video. Watch for the beginning of the collapse. This is frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. We're up to frame 30. Did you see the collapse begin? I didn't. Try rewinding the video a few times. It's pretty boring. There's not the slightest hint of any collapse until frame 40. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70. There's a tiny motion of the corner of the West Penthouse at frame 40. Then there is no more motion until about frame 46. Note that the motion of the penthouse precedes the movement of the roof line. There is no measurable movement of the roof line until frame 46. That's a full second beyond frame 16. Even then, there isn't any progressive ongoing movement of the roof line until about frame 60. 
By then we're back to just over 3.9 seconds of collapse time, or in other words, the onset of freefall. The only rationale I can see for choosing frame 16 to start the clock is to make the measurement come out to exactly 5.4 seconds, to agree with the prediction of NIST's collapse model. But what if I'm wrong? What if they did see some tiny movement on a clearer version of the video? That tiny movement, whatever it might have been, did not last. It would have had to have been a glitch, and the scientists at NIST would recognize it as a glitch, because there's no measurable difference in the height of the roofline for the next 20 to 30 frames. What can we conclude? You can draw your own conclusions, but I think it's pretty clear that the whole idea there was any kind of real 5.4 second collapse interval is a fiction. It's a crude fabrication, and the three-stage collapse sequence is pseudoscience in the service of an ongoing cover-up. In part three, we will return to the central question. In conceding freefall, what has NIST actually admitted? Shyam Sundar is the lead investigator for the NIST analysis of the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7. In the technical briefing on August 26, Dr. Sundar clearly explained why freefall for World Trade Center 7 was impossible. The analysis showed there's a difference in time between a freefall time. A freefall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. And that is not at all unusual because there, there was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. And you had, you had a sequence of structural failures that had to take place and where everything was not instantaneous. That was before they were forced to acknowledge that freefall actually occurred. Once they acknowledged freefall, they claimed without elaboration that their new analysis was consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis. I'm not making this up. This is their own words. Freefall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. Sunder's original remarks make sense under the assumption of a natural collapse. Anything at an elevated height has gravitational potential energy. If it falls and none of the energy is used for other things along the way, all of that energy is converted into kinetic energy, the energy of motion, and we call it freefall. If any of the energy is used for other purposes, there will be less kinetic energy, so the fall will be slower. In the case of a falling building, the only way it can go into free fall is if an external force removes the supporting structure. None of the gravitational potential energy of the building is available for this purpose, or it would slow the fall of the building. The fact of free fall by itself is strong evidence of explosive demolition, but the evidence is even stronger than that. My original analysis looks like this. I have since confirmed my measurement using a different software package. Both of these graphs plot velocity versus time. A straight line indicates constant acceleration, and the slope of the line indicates the rate of acceleration. What is particularly striking is the suddenness of onset of freefall. The acceleration doesn't build up gradually. The graph simply turns a corner. The building went from full support to zero support instantly. This graph is upside down relative to mine, but that's really not an issue. Their data is almost the same. What is dramatically different is the curve they superimpose on the data. This curve has no physical significance whatsoever. It is merely a hypothetical interpretation of the data. It is literally the mathematical equivalent of laying a wet noodle on the graph and nudging it around until it fits the data. The straight part fits the data reasonably well. What is totally misleading are the gradual transitions into and out of free fall. The raw data speaks for itself. One moment the building is holding, the next moment it lets go and is in complete free fall. The onset of free fall was not only sudden, it extended across the whole width of the building. My measurement of the acceleration of the building was based on the northwest corner. This recent measurement confirming free fall was based on a point midway along the roof line. The fact that the roof stayed level shows the building was in free fall across the entire width. 
The collapse we see cannot be due to a column failure or a few column failures or a sequence of column failures. All 24 interior columns and 58 perimeter columns had to have been removed over the span of eight floors low in the building simultaneously to within a small fraction of a second and in such a way that the top half of the building remains intact and uncrumpled. Let's come back to NIST's acceptance of freefall. Here is their exact wording. Quote, the three stages of collapse progression described above are consistent with the results of the global collapse analysis discussed in Chapter 12 of NIST NC Star 1-9. In other words, they're giving the appearance of claiming free fall is okay, but actually it's the 5.4 second duration of their three-stage analysis that matches their model. But we saw in Part 2 of this video series that the 5.4 seconds depends on an artificially early start time, which has no valid observational basis. Without the 5.4 second fig leaf, they are left with free fall and nothing more. NIST does not show how free fall is consistent with their hypothesis, because, as Shyam Sundar has correctly and eloquently explained, free fall for a naturally collapsing building is impossible. This brings us to their computer model. This so-called investigation actually consists of finding a way to reproduce the mysterious collapse of the building using a computer model. The assumption is that if the computer model can be made to reproduce the observed collapse pattern, that must be how it happened. The problem is, if something unexpected was going on, like explosives for instance, you're not going to discover it in the computer model. For that, you need to look at the actual evidence. So why not examine the steel directly? Oh yes, there isn't any. At least there isn't any after it was hauled away to Asia and melted down. NIST's investigation has been compared to conducting an autopsy without the corpse. As of 2005, NIST reported having only 236 pieces of steel from the World Trade Center complex, none of them unambiguously identified as being from World Trade Center 7. We've all watched CSI. Anyone serious about solving a crime knows the importance of physical evidence. Yet here the crime scene was scrubbed, the evidence was destroyed, and the investigation was delayed for years. Destroying a crime scene is itself a criminal act. Destroying the steel has absolutely no justification except to cover up the cause of the collapse. So even if we knew nothing else about the events of that day, we can see immediately there was a cover-up. Knowing there was a cover-up is a strong indication there was a crime someone wanted covered up. Any investigation that does not acknowledge this basic fact is not really an investigation. It's an extension of the cover-up. NIST claims their computer model can account for the observed phenomena. So let's look at NIST's model. Except we can't. The software they use to do the modeling is available, but their model actually consists of all the numbers and measurements and assumptions together with any tweaks to the system they might have used to get it to come out the way they wanted. If that information were released, their results could be checked by anyone with the appropriate skills and software tools. But NIST has not released the numbers. All we've been shown are some of the selected animated outputs they were able to get their model to produce. Is their model realistic? We don't know. Some models are chaotic in the mathematical sense. In other words, tiny variations in the inputs might result in wildly different outcomes. Is NIST's model stable or chaotic? realistic or contrived, honest or fraudulent. We don't know. We can't know without independent testing. The very process of running the model until it produces the kind of result you're looking for is called selection bias. If you think about it, NIST methodology is explicitly based on selection bias. Even if you could show what might have happened, it doesn't show what actually did happen. The very fact that NIST has not released their model strongly suggests they don't want their results checked. In other words, their results are intended to be taken strictly on faith. If NIST has not released their modeling data and their assumptions, they have really not released their report. And the fact that this is their final report indicates they do not intend to do so. Therefore, on the face of it, their report is little more than a fancy, expensive cover-up. One fact we do know about NIST's model is it does not allow for freefall. The best they could do is 5.4 seconds for the building to crumple down through 18 floors. Crumpling absorbs energy, and that makes freefall impossible. 
There's nothing in the models we have been shown that even resemble a three-stage collapse with a free-fall component. After all, as Shyam Sundar put it himself, free-fall happens only when there are no structural components below the falling section of the building. Any natural scenario is going to involve a progression of failures, and these don't happen instantaneously. So, in the end, we come back to where we were in the beginning. On first impression, we were looking at a classic controlled demolition. NIST claimed to have found a way it could have happened naturally, but in fact, they failed. The only way they can support their claim is through lies, secrecy, and pompous but false pronouncements. That constitutes a failed agenda. Explosive demolition is the only scenario that has been put forward that could actually account for the observations. Where does that leave us? We have a building that underwent directly observable and now officially acknowledged freefall, with no plausible mechanisms other than explosive demolition. We have an official investigation by a government agency that has fraudulently manipulated data, and has refused to even consider existing physical evidence that explosives were used. They have wrapped themselves and their data in secrecy and offered up pronouncements as conclusions to be taken on faith. The NIST investigation is a fraud and a farce. We need a new, fully empowered, truly independent, and open investigation.